Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. Today's video is one that was requested a couple of times in the comment section and it was to look at the lectures of a woman called Pam Stenzel, specifically one called Sex Has a Price Tag. Obviously I heard this and I was like, yes, okay, we're watching this, let's see what happens. Before I did, I did a little bit of research about who is Pam and According to Wikipedia, Pam Stenzel, born in 1965, is an American speaker known for lecturing young people about abstinence-only sex education. So we already know I'm gonna hate her. <laughs> she has been described as one of the country's most established abstinence-only lecturers and speaks to more than half a million young people every year around the world. Even though the video that we're gonna be looking at today, which is titled Sex Has a Price Tag, is quite old, it was put out in, I wanna say, around 2009, 2010 from what I can tell, it's hard to find an exact date. So it's a little outdated, it's, you know, 10, 12 years old now and it looks a lot older, I'll be honest, from the quality that I've got of the recording, it's not great. But she's still giving talks like this today and she's also done a few more recent ones as well. So if you like this video, we're gonna be going through it, watching it, fact checking it, talking about some of the issues with it and also some of the places where she does do good work. But if you'd like to see me respond to some of her uh, more recent talks and lectures, then we can do that too and kind of make this a little bit of a series. One thing is, again, when looking at Pam's past. I think it was Wikipedia again, said, Stenzel began her career counselling young women at crisis pregnancy centres and served as a director of Alpha Women's Centre in Prior Lake, Minnesota for, for years. Her website states that after working at these centres, she realised that many women who came there were unaware of the risks associated with sex and birth control and so decided to become a public speaker. And this is actually a really, really noble cause. It's a really important thing to talk about and I can't fault her for her reasons behind doing what she does, you know. She is right. People need to be educated about sex. Lack of sex education is why so many people end up with unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, or having sex before they're emotionally ready, or not understanding or misunderstanding consent. That said, <laughs> While I think Pam is right that more education is needed, I feel that her definition of what good sex education is and my definition of that differ greatly. <laughs> and that's a huge problem that we're gonna see going forward in this video. There was apparently a whole load of drama around one of her talks that she gave in 2013. So I have a feeling it could have been potentially this same talk that we've got a recording of today, but just done a couple of years later. There was a whole like drama around that when she spoke at apparently George Washington High School in Charleston, West Virginia. A student called Caitlin Campbell complained about the talk saying that it was slut shaming and a bunch of other stuff and I completely agree because according to the Huff Post, Pam reportedly made extreme and false comments such as, if you take birth control, your mother probably hates you. And I could look at any one of you in the eyes right now and tell you if you're gonna be promiscuous. Stenzel called sexually active students impure and condemned any individuals who had engaged in sexual activity outside of marriage. Stenzel's overall attitude was that any type of sex will guarantee the contraction of an STD or unwanted pregnancy. That is exactly what we're gonna see from this talk that we're gonna be looking at today and we're gonna be taking it apart bit by bit and looking at the problems with it. What's even more disgusting though is that back in 2013 when, when this student criticized Stenzel, yeah, it was the head teacher of her school then responded to these complaint, complaints by threatening to contact the college that this Caitlin Campbell had been accepted to and tell her that she had bad character and was like immoral and blah 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 and it, it's disgusting. You can't take away someone's education because they stood up for people's sexual rights. It's ridiculous, not even that. She just asked for people to be treated with a bit of respect. It, shocking. What's also disgusting is that Stenzel reportedly gets paid between $4,000 and $6,000 for each talk she gives. And as you'll see from today's video, it is not worth that. It, oh God, it's horrible. Let's, uh, you know, let's just jump into this, watch some clips and talk about them together. For nine years, I would have girls in my office every day saying, Pam, I didn't know. If someone would have told me that this is what was gonna happen to me, I would have made a different choice. No one told me. And after nine years, I realized that there were a lot of students out there making decisions about sex, having absolutely no idea. None. 
what the consequence of that choice will be. It's going to talk about tonight. As I said in the introduction, she absolutely has a point here. Lack of sex education is what causes people to make mistakes. It causes people to fall pregnant when they don't want to, to contract STIs, to not understand how to get them tested or treated, uh, to have sex before they're ready or with the wrong partners, not fully understand what consent is and how to ask for it, to give it, to hear it, and a whole bunch of other issues. But do you know what is worse than no information around sex? Misinformation around sex. And that is exactly what Pam goes on to do in this talk. Abstinence-only sex education like Pam gives in this talk, if you can call it education, it's just a, just a rant on her part. She, she shouts and rants for an hour. I find her very uncomfortable to listen to because she just shouts and rants and is quite incoherent at times and it feels like she's doing these talks to feed her own ego rather than anything else but we'll get into that in a bit. But I feel these abstinence only sex education rants like Pam does are a combination of the worst parts of no information and misinformation combined. It's not helpful, it doesn't really address the problems, it does not help people. I have many problems with it. And as I say, these videos are really hard to watch because normally I don't like to comment on the individuals and I prefer to be like, no, let's talk about the content of what they're saying and their actions rather than who they are as people. But I just find her incredibly obnoxious and it really bothers me because she spends half of this talk just mocking teenagers. And that is not helpful for anyone. Like, listen to this. Two rules in my house were this. First rule was no dating at all, period, none, until you're 16, ever. There is no student in this room who is not 16 who should be dating ever, ever, ever. You're brain damaged, this too will pass. And you're, oh no, you know, ninth grade girls will date anything that walks. Is he walking and breathing? That's my criteria. That's all I need to know. It's good enough. Unbelievable. There are ways to discuss the differing maturity levels of teenagers and young adults without insulting them and calling them brain dead. That's just horrible. You're not going to win over any audience and convince them, hmm, yeah, this is a woman who cares about my sexual health and well-being and so on and will provide me with good information by mocking them. She is absolutely insufferable and no teenager with any ounce of self-respect is going to take information and trust a woman who openly mocks them. And if you'd like proof, just take a look at some of these clips of the audience. There are all these parents who all look like they're called Steve and Karen, just laughing away while the teenagers look angry. And I don't blame them at all. If some woman was there to educate me and she spent the first four and a half minutes of her speech just mocking me, I'd be angry too. And then she goes on this big rant about how she's a parent and she doesn't need her daughter to like her and blah, blah, blah. My daughter didn't like me very much in high school. I had news for my teenage daughter. I have friends, and I don't need her. <laughs> she has friends. She doesn't need me. I wasn't called to be my daughter's buddy. This is not a popularity contest. I and I kind of get it, because I get that some parents are too lenient with their kids, and some people try too much to like be friends with their kids rather than actually parenting and being there to guide them and help them. But there are others who are so strict they don't bother to respect their child, they don't act like they even like their child, they don't care about building a real relationship with their child. That seems what Pam is bragging about here. And honestly, that's the quickest way to lose your child, to push them away, to get them to not trust you at all. I can promise you from experience, you act like you don't even like your child, don't treat them with respect, don't anything, and as soon as they take and as soon as they turn 18, or as soon as they can, they're gonna run away from you and never look back. Um, and then, nine minutes in, after nine minutes of her ranting about being a parent and hating teenagers and how great she is, after nine minutes, we finally get a little summary of the core message of her talk. And here you go. If you have sex outside of marriage, if you have sex outside of one permanent monogamous and monogamy does not mean one at a time. That means one partner who has only been with you. If you have sex outside of that context, you will pay. There is a cost. I don't care how old you are. And oh my God, is there a lot to unpack in that. <laughs> I, don't worry, we're gonna cover it all throughout this video. What do you think most teenagers who are having sex are afraid of? What's their biggest fear? Pregnancy is the biggest fear of teens having sex today. Doesn't make a bit of sense to me. Got a newsflash for you tonight. Wisconsin pregnancy is not a disease. 
It's actually survivable. You can live through it. I've lived through it three times now. A few extra pounds here and there, it hasn't killed me yet. Again, we're opening straight away with misinformation because, and surprise, surprise, Pam Stenzel is pro-force pregnancy, anti-choice, or she likes to call it pro-life. <laughs> this is so ridiculous because for so many people, pregnancy is not survivable because of how it affects their physical health and their mental health. Pregnancy isn't this, oh, like it just made me put on a little bit of weight thing. Pregnancy does have a drastic effect on the body. It puts so much strain on the body, even for people who want to be pregnant. And it's absolutely okay to be afraid of pregnancy, no matter what age you are. Just because STIs are also scary, that doesn't stop pregnancy being scary. I'd have girls in my office for pregnancy tests scared out of their minds. Waiting for the results of that test, I walk in, look at this girl and say, your test is negative, sweetheart, you're not pregnant. She gets this look of relief over her face, like I'm off the hook, not pregnant, thank you very much. Let me out of your office, wait a minute. Have you been tested for syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomus, vulvodemia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HPV, HIV, have you been tested for that? Me? I live in Green Bay. <laughs> Pam, I, I don't live in Menominee. <laughs> you mean I? I would need to be tested for that. This girl is in my office thinking she could possibly be pregnant and she does not think she could have a disease. In this section, I do actually agree with her and I think this is a really important thing to talk about. These are huge risks. Young people do absolutely need comprehensive education around STIs. But where I disagree with Pam, and what I think is that the way to educate people around STIs and make people more aware of STIs and, and to reduce the number of STIs is to de-stigmatize those conversations around them. Absolutely normalize about talking about them, sharing your experiences, normalize going to get tested. Take it away from being this like horribly stigmatized thing where you feel dirty if you have one and instead make it just like any other illness where you're like, hey, you know what, this happened, I'm gonna get treated, this is okay. Even I, as an adult, went and had an STI test last week. And when I got there, the woman was like, oh, you know, like, what symptoms do you have? And I was like, none. And she was like, oh, so why are you here? And I was like, just like getting regularly tested. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel in control of my body. And it lets me know where I'm at with my health. And it's reassuring for any future partners I have, you know? It's, it's a good thing to do. And it's not something to feel embarrassed about or ashamed about or anything like that. And I do think there is still stigma around it. So I remember like when I turned up at the clinic and um, I went over and I asked whether, uh, like I said I had an appointment and the woman was like, oh, um, what are you here for? And I just went, oh, an STI test. And she went, the sexual health clinic's over there. And I was like, you don't need to whisper. This is absolutely fine. <laughs> like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not embarrassed about it. There's nothing embarrassing about taking care of your health, you know? And regular testing like that is what everyone who is or has been sexually active needs to do and it's completely normal because sometimes accidents happen and that's okay. Sometimes condoms fail, sometimes infections can lie dormant for a while, sometimes we have infections without symptoms and these are all things that teenagers and in fact all people need to be educated on. And more specifically, we need to teach people, especially young people, how they can go and get an STI test in their area. We need to teach them why they're important and we need to stop shaming people for getting tested and stop shaming people if they do end up with an infection because most are completely treatable and there's absolutely no shame in getting one. What Pam is doing here is not educating, she is shaming and that is not okay. And it's weird because all of this comes back to purity culture and shaming people for being sexual beings, you know? We don't shame someone for getting a broken leg because, oh, you shouldn't have been skateboarding in the first place. Not sure if we should treat this because it's your own fault. You chose to skateboard. We don't shame people for catching a cold because, well, you chose to go out in public. How dare you? We don't do that but we do around STIs. And it's the same with like unwanted pregnancies, you know? So often online I see people saying, well, well, pregnancy is the consequence of sex. You chose to have sex, you have to deal with the consequences of that, even if that includes an unwanted pregnancy. But we don't tell someone with lung cancer that they need to deal with the consequences of that and not have any treatment just because they decided to smoke for a few years, you know? You can't withhold treatment for someone just because you don't like how they got ill, because you don't like how they got in a physical situation, you don't like 
what they did to their own body. You can't refuse to give someone healthcare for those reasons. Anyway, sorry, that was a rant. Uh, back to the STIs. Pam goes on to tell some stats that are out of date now, but have a listen to them. Students, you have a four times greater risk of contracting a disease today than you ever have of being pregnant. Pregnant teenage girls in Wisconsin, pregnant teen girls in your state today are carrying on average 2.3 sexually transmitted diseases. Not one, not two, most of them three or more. And while these stats aren't accurate anymore, I'm gonna say they're probably around similar numbers-ish because this is what happens when you don't have comprehensive sex education. And yet here she is still just shaming these kids instead of offering them any actual help and advice. And the thing is, throughout all of this, and you'll see towards the end, Pam hates condoms. She never once tells people to use condoms. She goes on about how ineffective condoms are and how awful they are and so on. And again, we'll cover this in more detail later, but that's why STIs are so high. Because if you tell people you're gonna catch them whether you use condoms or not, so just don't have sex, people are still gonna have sex, but then they're gonna think, well, if there's a risk either way, I'll just not use a condom. Bad sex education and misinformation like Pam spreads leads to increased rates of STIs. Simple as that. Then she goes on a little rant again about why you must get a pregnancy than an STI. And I'm like, because most STIs are treatable. Whereas if you have an unwanted pregnancy, especially in America nowadays and in many countries around the world, there's nothing you can do about that. Despite there still being a huge stigma around STIs, it is still easier to get access to treatment than to an abortion. And when you look at the costs of getting tested for and treating STIs in countries like America compared to uh, the costs of pregnancy or abortion, STIs are way more affordable. <laughs> That's why some people are more afraid of pregnancies. Obviously, unwanted pregnancies and STIs should both be avoided, but it's okay that different people are more worried about different things, you know? I will have a girl write me, email me, or come right up to me and say this. Well, my mom found out I was having sex, and so she put me on the pill. Or depot, the shot, fill in the blank. What's that protecting that girl from? What does birth control protect you from? Pregnancy most of the time. That drug, that hormone, that pill, that shot that this girl is taking has just made her 10 times more likely to contract a disease than if she were not taking that drug, this girl could end up sterile or dead. Thanks, Mom. Glad you cared. Segments like this are just absolute unnecessary fear-mongering. There are absolutely ways to talk about the consequences of STIs and how serious they are without taking this tone. Here, Pam is literally shaming mothers for helping their daughters take birth control, but missing the most important point, which is to teach people with uteruses that generally, unless you and your partner have been tested and are completely exclusive with each other, you should always, always, always be using condoms and birth control where possible. If you don't want a pregnancy, always use them both. If you don't want STIs, always use condoms, always. Unless, of course, you're both having regular tests and are exclusive. That's the only case where you're okay to forego them, you know? It's basically the facts that it's important to teach all people in general are that birth control will reduce your chance of pregnancy greatly and might also help with other things like managing, managing periods or acne or other health problems like that. Condoms will reduce your chance of pregnancy and reduce your chance of STIs, but only when used correctly. And also there are other options of physical contraceptive barriers you can use like dental dams and so on, and you should be educated about what they all are and how to use them correctly. That is what Pam should be teaching people, not just, thanks mums, you're killing your daughters by getting them on birth control. That kind of talk is only gonna stop parents from helping their kids actually get birth control, and is just a really, really unhelpful thing. This kind of shaming talk of shaming parents for helping their kids and talking about their sexual health with them and helping them get what they need, shaming them for that is only gonna cause more unwanted pregnancies. Is pregnancy the worst thing that could happen if you had sex today? Speaking purely as a 29-year-old child-free by choice woman in the UK with the NHS, yes, that is my biggest fear. And then she goes on a typical anti-abortion rant of you will regret this and so on. And 
Again, it's important to educate people, especially young people, about what abortion is and how it entails, but horror stories like this do not help anyone at all. Abortion is painful. I've counseled hundreds of women, 5, 10, 15 years after having an abortion, still hurting. I've counseled teenage girls with anorexia, bulimia, depression, attempted suicide, cutting because of an abortion they couldn't take back. That is not like going to the dentist and getting your tooth pulled. There are consequences lifelong to that choice. If instead you'd like some accurate and honest information about what happens during an abortion, I do have a video in which I responded to the LeBrant family's anti-abortion document documentary. <laughs> um, and I go into like quite a lot of detail there and it's quite educational and helpful. So if you would like to see that without any of the misinformation, you can go find that on my channel. I will link it in the video description below and it should be popping up on screen somewhere now. Skipping forward through this video through a lot of shouting, and I mean a lot of shouting. The guy's name was Kanye West, the song was called Gold Digger. And an entire verse of this song, this Super Bowl player's whining. Cause he has to leave the Super Bowl in a Hyundai. Cause his baby mama buying bling with this money, getting lipo with this money. There's a bit which could actually be helpful, right? And she explains that chlamydia is caused by a bacteria, something everyone needs to know, and that it can be treated with antibiotics, absolutely true, and that regular STI testing is important. Brilliant, wonderful, love that. Uh, she also says that chlamydia can often present with no symptoms and so you have to be careful, and that if it goes untreated in women, it can affect your fertility. These are all wonderful, amazing, brilliant points that should be told, but she never tells you how to prevent it. Not once. <laughs> Chlamydia, one of the most common diseases among the teenagers sitting here tonight, and yes, I said that and meant it. One of the most common diseases among the students sitting here tonight is chlamydia. This is a bacteria, not a virus. Easily treated and easily cured. If we knew you had it, we could help you. Seven days worth of antibiotics now given in two doses, and we can wipe this out. Two types of STD students. If you have not yet had biology, or if you flunked, pay attention. You'll get a better grade on your SATs, okay? Two types of STDs. This is not hard. Bacterial and viral. A bacteria is curable. There is medication we can give you. We can take care of that. A virus is not. You get a virus, you've got it for life. There is no cure. We have never in the history of the world cured a virus. Chlamydia is not a virus, it's a bacteria, it's curable, so what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. And 90% of the teenagers sitting here tonight who have chlamydia, there are no symptoms. You can't treat a disease you don't know you have. We got thousands of teenagers out here having sex going, well, it's not bothering me, because, I mean, I've had sex, but I don't have a disease. Never been tested, certainly not in the last three weeks, but I know I don't have anything. How in the world would you know that? Let me tell you something's pretty safe to say I know about you. If there's a teenager sitting here tonight who's had sex, let me tell you something I know about you. It's true of students all over the world. It's not different here. You actually believe that if you get up the next morning and herpes isn't tattooed to your forehead, you don't have a disease. I mean, if I can't see it, feel it, or touch it, I don't have it. Pam, if I had a disease, I would know. My nose would turn purple, my ears would be red, something would burn. I would know. No, you would not. The only way you'd know is if you got tested. Teenagers don't get tested because you don't think it's going to happen to you. And you actually think if you don't feel sick, you're not sick. If you'd like to prevent yourself from getting chlamydia, then when possible, always, always, always get tested before sleeping with a new partner and after sleeping with them and always, always, always use a physical contraceptive like a condom. Things like chlamydia can take two or more weeks to show up after you've had sex with someone, so it's important that once you have had sex with a new partner, go get tested again after a couple of weeks. But there are absolutely no mentions of any of these things in Pam's talk. Her delivery is horrific and infuriating and I hate listening to her. And I think on the whole, this is just mostly really bad. Um, and then we get her solution to this big STI crisis, um, and it's simply publicly shame anyone with an STI, because that'll work. This is literally the opposite of what is helpful and what is needed. I would like the whole school to know, but maybe we could put it on the announcements. I'm working on this. Every high school I'm speaking in, I beg their principal, from now on at your high school, every Monday morning on the Monday announcements, the following students contracted an STD over the weekend. They are. People, that would be helpful. Then we would know. What did you think? Did you think you were going to show up the Monday after homecoming, walk the hallway? 
always at the school and go, purple nose. Did you see his nose, girls? He did not have that last Friday. Don't touch him. Herpes. I saw his nose. The fact is whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you're pro-abstinence until marriage or not, people are gonna have sex. It's inevitable. Humans like sex and people are gonna do it, including teenagers, whether we like it or not. Mistakes are gonna happen to even the most careful people. And, <laughs> and you know what? This might, might be embarrassing, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. Uh, mistakes happen to everyone, even when you do everything right. Because a few years back, I did everything right and I still got chlamydia. I had a boyfriend and we both went and got tested together and we got a clean bill of health and I was on the pill and a few months later I went back for another checkup as I regularly do and I had chlamydia and I'd had no symptoms and I was using birth control and I thought we could forego condoms because, you know, we were both clean and I did everything right. I just didn't account for the fact he was cheating on me and gave me chlamydia. Understandably, I was upset and I felt like absolute crap and I felt dirty and disgusting and like horrified with myself. And the treatment was easy. A couple of pills, done. I think actually it might have just been one pill for me. I can't remember, it was a few years back now, but it was really, really easy. It wasn't an issue. It cost me like nine quid to get the treatment through the NHS, like with a prescription, it was nothing. Even getting tested was super easy and wonderful and everyone there was lovely. Looking back now, I'm not ashamed of it because I did absolutely nothing wrong. I took all the precautions that I needed to. I wasn't the one cheating in that situation. He was, so I have nothing to be ashamed of there. And I did everything right in taking responsibility for my own health, getting tested regularly. And when I found out I had something, I got treatment and that was it. Moved on, done, absolutely fine. No long-term consequences, other than it took me a long time to trust men after that. <laughs> but even though I felt horrible at the time, I don't feel so bad about it now. And the whole experience taught me that the only person really responsible for my physical and sexual health is me. And that I need to take responsibility for that and look after myself. And that's why I still go and get regular testing, even with long-term partners, even when I've been single for a long time, all of it. I go and get regularly tested so I can feel in control of my body and I've been absolutely fine ever since. And I'm telling you these things because I want to reduce that stigma and take it away and normalise talking about these things and know that it's nothing to be ashamed of. Because do you know what does happen when you shame people for having STIs? You do not reduce the number of people contracting them, but you do reduce the number of people willing to go and get tested for them. Because you can't be shamed for it if no one knows you're infected, right? Not even yourself. Because if people are afraid of being ashamed for having an STI, they're not going to want to know if they have an STI or anyone else to know so they're just going to go around without being tested without being treated and spread it around to more people but if you reduce the stigma around STIs if you make sure no one's ashamed if they have them and if you increase access to and decrease the cost of testing then more people will get tested more people will get treated and fewer people will be infected simple as that costs absolutely nothing in the UK to go get an STI test Nothing at all. And if you do need treatment, usually it's a pres prescription, it costs you nine quid. Easy as that. You can do it so simply, so quickly, it's not a problem at all. Reducing STIs isn't just about telling people stop having sex. It's not even just about telling people use condoms every time. In general, you need to reduce the stigma around STIs and make sure people feel comfortable talking about them, sharing their experience with, experiences with them and getting tested for them. I think this clip here of Pam epitomizes everything wrong with this talk from her because it's very clear to me that this performance is more because it is, it's not an educational lecture, it's a performance for her. And it's more about her ego than actually educating teenagers. Her whole tone, her demeanor, her teachings, her word choice, who she's directing her comments to. It feels more like she's doing bad stand-up to try and make the parents laugh than actually wanting to educate the teenagers. The butt of all her jokes is, ha ha ha, kids are stupid, right parents? And that's not gonna educate any young person at all, is it? A more casual tone, being funny, great ways to keep people engaged and listening and learning, but that's not what she's doing here. What she's doing is just demeaning and condescending, and there's actually, when you pull it all apart, so little real information in this talk. And then we get a little bit of casual slut shaming um, about girls, but directed to the boys in the audience. Young men, please hear me. If there is a girl throwing herself at you, 
If this girl is pressuring you for sex, if what you're telling me is true, and this is one of those girls who's dressing in that manner that's saying to you and every other boy in the county, take me now. Little word of advice, boys, run from this girl, run away. I did not say walk, I said run from her. Let me tell you about this girl. I know her well. This is a little girl who's bought the lie of a culture that has told her what makes her valuable is her body. So in order to feel good about herself, she needs to turn your head, sweetheart. And when she is done turning yours, she's going to need to turn his and then 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 his. And this will not end when she's 18, 20, 25, 30, 35, or 40. This is a lifelong problem. Who do you want to be the mother of your children? Young men, girls, the respect and integrity you show yourself and every boy in your circle by the way you dress, by the way you chat, by the way you talk about what you're doing with your friends, that is the trust you will hand your husband someday. Pretty white dresses and flowers do not fix this. Now, the pressuring bit I agree with here. If someone is pressuring you for sex, then you are absolutely within your rights to keep saying no, maintain your boundaries, and walk away. That is absolutely reasonable, and you should do that. Wonderful. But a girl or woman simply showing an interest in sex, saying they enjoy sex, or even dressing in a way that's a little more re revealing, is not a bad thing. That's not something to be shunned and being told to run away from. This whole narrative is simply, if a woman enjoys sex and uh, she isn't relationship material and run away from her, run. It's so, so harmful. Women are allowed to be sexual beings and want to express and enjoy their sexuality however they want to. Again, as long as it's all consensual. That is not something to shame women for. And that's exactly what Pam does and continues to do throughout this entire speech. This idea that good women, proper women, relationship material women, which is also a term I have a huge problem with, the idea that they don't really like sex, they won't ask for sex, they won't push for sex, like it's so disgusting and harmful and wrong, plain wrong. Making women suppress their sexuality and feel ashamed of it has been used to control women for years and it's really disgusting seeing this internalised misogyny in people like Pam where they think a woman being sexual is an inherently bad thing. Let's just stop it already, okay? Uh, then we get a little more STI shaming and it's just really gross. I was standing waiting for the hotel van to pick me up at the airport today and this guy starts talking to me and, oh, what do you do for a living speaker? Who do you talk to, teenagers? What about sex? <laughs> I made some comment. He blatantly, sitting outside the Green Bay Airport, tells me that his friend just found out he had herpes. Everybody's got herpes. I'm well aware. <laughs> Stay over there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then she goes on a little section about HPV and smear tests and cervical cancer. And this is a bit of a long one, but I want you to listen to this in full and then we'll talk about it. Sweetheart, you are at absolute highest risk and you need that yearly pap test. If you were my daughter, it would be every six months. Negative pap, ladies, does not mean you don't have the virus. It means you don't yet have cervical cancer. Some of you have heard that there's a vaccine for this virus. 2006, Merck released a vaccine called Gardasil. You may have seen some of the commercials. One less, one less, tell someone. The media made you believe that this was a vaccine for cancer. This is not a vaccine for cancer. This is a vaccine for a sexually transmitted disease. Gardasil is a vaccine for HPV. Here's what you need to know about Gardasil. Gardasil, the vaccine for HPV, is currently only being given to girls. We are not vaccinating any boys at all. We are only vaccinating girls. Gardasil, in order to be somewhat effective, needs to be given to a girl who is, in fact, a virgin. If you are not a virgin, the vaccine will most likely do no good. Now, they're willing to take your 800 bucks cash. They made $4 billion last year, so they'll probably give it to whoever. But, but in order for it to be effective, we need you to be a virgin, which is why we were targeting 11- and 12-year-old girls for this vaccine. Ladies, if you are a virgin, or you were a virgin at the time you were vaccinated, Gardasil, given to a virgin girl, is good for four out of the 100 strains of this virus. There are 96 strains still there. This in no way guarantees you will not be infected with HPV and does not guarantee you will not get cervical cancer. Ladies, if you were vaccinated as a virgin, once you become sexually active, you will still need regular pap tests. Okay, so, there are bits and bobs of truth in this segment, but also, 
it's not quite right. And I'm aware that this is an older video, so some parts might just be outdated, but others are just blatantly wrong and have always been wrong. <laughs> so, I can only speak for the UK here, but... So again, discrepancies there because US might be different, but I don't know. But in the UK here, smear tests or cervical cancer screening, they're known as both, are given to all women and people who are assigned female at birth every three to five years, more if you're at risk. Pam's statement that all these tests do is tell you if, if you have cancer yet is blatantly wrong. That is not what those tests are screening for. A smear test in the UK does test for the presence of HPV and it also tests for any abnormalities in the cervix. Um, it's a really simple process, takes about 10 minutes, doesn't cost a thing. Um, I've had one, I've had two actually, really quick, really simple, nothing to be scared of at all. If your results do come back saying that you have abnormal cells or a presence of HPV, then that does not mean you have cancer. Having HPV does not mean you have cancer. S having certain strains of HPV can increase your chance of developing cervical cancer. Abnormalities in the cervical cells can indicate either the presence of cancer or a risk of cancer, but it's not immediately a death sentence as Pam paints it to be. Now, there is a HPV vaccine. I had mine back when I was like 14, 15, 16, so it's somewhere around that age. Um, I don't know exactly. And it was one we got given in a couple of doses over however long period of time. I don't know which brand, if you can call it that, that I had, um, but it's on record somewhere. Um, and again, even though you might have to pay for this in America, in the UK, it's completely free. Now, Pam's line here about how this only works on virgins is an outright lie. There is no truth in that at all. She is simply incorrect. Whether you've had sex or not doesn't affect how effective this vaccine is. However, the vaccine is most effective if you haven't previously been exposed to HPV, which means you can have had sex and not be exposed to HPV and the vaccine will work perfectly effectively it'll be great. Or if you've not had sex, but you have had some geni genital skin to skin contact, there is a chance you've been exposed to HPV and that can reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine. So it's nothing to actually do with if you've had sex or not. It's to do with if you've been previously exposed to HPV or not. That said, if you have been exposed to HPV still and you get the vaccine, it can still help you. It will still be effective, just maybe not as effective against some strains as others. And there's another thing as well where you might need multiple doses of some of them if you've previously been exposed and so on. So her line about this vaccine won't work if you're not a virgin is pure fear-mongering misinformation and it is wrong. Please do not listen to her. The other thing she's wrong about is who's allowed to get the vaccine. She says only women and girls can get it. Completely wrong. Men can absolutely be vaccinated against HPV too. It's not necessarily as common and you might have to go to the doctor and ask for it and say, hey, I want to get the HPV vaccine, but men absolutely can get it as well. I know in the UK it was rolled out for like all girls in schools and we were just given it as standard, but to this day, boys and men can absolutely go and get the vaccine too if they want. They're carriers of it. They're at risk as well. And now there are studies that show that HPV may have uh, links to, I think it's like penile cancer, which sounds horrible, I know, and it's quite rare, but there are studies that show it can be linked to that. So again, if you're a man, good idea to go and get vaccinated, because you can. The other thing she is slightly right about, but then goes on to spit a lot of information about, is that uh, the 2006 Gardasil vaccine does only protect against four strains of strains of HPV, and there's like 90 odd strains of it out there. Gardasil in 2006 protected against strains 6, 11, 16, and 18. And you're like, okay, well that's not many. Why is it only protected against them? But what Pam isn't telling you is that strains 16 and 18 are the main causes of cervical cancer, more than any of the other 90 odd strains. So it is protecting against the most dangerous strains. 70% of cervical cancers, of all cervical cancers, are caused by strains 16 and 18 of HPV, which means the other 20% of cervical cancers are caused by strains 31, 33, 34, 
45, 52 and 58 and the other 10% of cervical cancers are caused by things other than HPV. Which means this vaccine was far more effective than Pam was making it out to be. The 90 odd other strains of HPV that it didn't protect against weren't cervical cancer causing strains. To update this information, you can't blame Pam for not knowing this because I think the talk was before this came out, but to update you, in 2014, Gardasil 9 was released and that is a new updated vaccine which does protect against strains 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58, all the cervical cancer causing strains, which means that vaccine will protect you against 90% of the cause of cervical cancer. It's a very effective vaccine. It's very, very good. The other thing that Pam doesn't mention is like I say, most strange of, strains of HPV, 80 odd of them, 90 odd of them, whatever it is, aren't cancer causing. Stats show that around 90% of all HPV infections, if left untreated, will go away by themselves in two years. They don't cause any problems, they don't cause any issues, they don't cause any symptoms, and they will go away by themselves. That said, out of the other 10%, some cause cervical cancer and some can cause genital warts. It's a small chance, but that's why vaccination, regular testing, and treatment for any symptoms um, or other complications is thoroughly advised. HPV is very, very serious and should be taken seriously. Vaccination is absolutely recommended, testing and treatment is recommended, but it's not an inevitable death sentence if you have sex, like Pam is making it out to be. Her numbers are all wrong, her stats are all wrong, her overall message is wrong, it's just a lot of misinformation there. And actually while we're on the misinformation train, let's look at this next clip. There's no way any person in this room under the age of 22 tonight could have sex with someone who is not in fact a virgin and not get a disease. It is not possible. You will get something, it will most likely be this. That is just not true at all. Not even a little bit. And it, it gets worse as well. Here's why. There is not a condom in the world that will protect you from HPV. I did not say it might slip, break, fall off, or you left it in the glove compartment. That is not what I said. Condoms used properly provide no protection at all from HPV. Again, completely not true. And this is what I spoke about briefly in the beginning. Telling people that condoms aren't effective isn't gonna help anyone. It's just gonna make people less likely to use condoms. They're like, oh, well, I mean, if it's not gonna help and I'm gonna catch something anyway, why bother using it? People like Pam, these talks, this misinformation of fear mongering, this blatant misinformation is why STD rates can be so high. Yes, HPV as a virus is spread by skin to skin contact. So there is some kind of risks and issues of like, you know, the area is not covered by a condom. But remember, a condom is a physical barrier. It is known to be effective against preventing the spread of HPV. It just is. Doctors, medical studies, everyone recommends it. It does help. The only reason she is saying this is because she wants to scare people into thinking that abstinence is the only way to escape a death sentence. Sex does not lead to death like Pam keeps telling people it does. Sex is a normal and healthy part of human relationships and unless you're asexual, you are probably gonna wanna do it at some point in your life. And the way to keep people safe while they do it is to provide them with the information on how to reduce the risks, not to just stop them from doing it or try to stop them from doing it or shame them for doing it. Give people the information, teach them how to manage the risks and let them make up their own mind. The other thing I find really bizarre in her talk is she keeps coming back to this idea that you have to tell every partner you're with about every single other partner you've been with, like by name, and details about every single thing you did with them. And if you don't, then you're a terrible bad person. It's ridiculous. And I would hate to, hate to have to be there, boys, when you had to tell the girl you loved and wanted to marry about every partner you've ever had, I have to know. Hear me carefully. My risk of infection has nothing to do with whether you used a condom or got tested. My risk of infection has everything to do with where you've been. I have to know every single partner you have ever had. It is unconscionable that anyone in this room, and I don't care how old you are or if you're the governor of New York, I don't care. It is unconscionable 
that anyone in this room would ever have sex with another human being and not honestly tell them everywhere you've been. Every single partner, I have to know. What happens at spring break does not stay at spring break in adults. What happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas either. Unbelievable that we think we can lie to our partners about where we've been. Unbelievable. No one needs to know those details except you. What your current or next partner needs to know is, when was your last comprehensive STI test? What were the results? What birth control are you using? And I'd argue you should tell them if you're sexually active with anyone else too. They're the things your partner needs to know. They don't need to know that you touched so-and-so's penis one time when you were 17 and he did this and that. Like, they don't need to know those details. They need to know, do you have any infections at this time? Will you go and get tested with them? Um, how are you protecting yourself and your partner from infections and unwanted pregnancy? And, and that's, that's it. That's all they need to know. Never let anyone shame you into telling them anything that you're not comfortable with about your past. They need to know what your health status is now and how you could affect theirs, and that's it. That's all the information you need to share. In light of that, what are you being told to do to make sure you don't get this virus that will kill you? If I said safe sex to teenagers in Wisconsin, what would most of them say? What's safe sex? Connor, sure, hey Pam, I can sleep with 18 people. I got a piece of latex. <laughs> Safe. Students' condoms aren't safe, never have been, never will be. The only safe sex is a safe partner. Someone who has never had sex, or if they have, hear me carefully. It has been five years from the last time they had sex of complete abstinence. Please have them virally blood tested. It's worth whatever it costs. Again, this is just a lie. A complete lie. And what is this five-year number? I don't get it at all. It's very bizarre. Seems arbitrary. Um, and then it just continues. Apparently, if you have casual sex and you find it fun, then you'll never be able to express real love to someone through sex, which is just a stupid thing to tell anyone and completely untrue. And there isn't a condom in the world that will ever protect your soul. It's not a game. It's not a recreational sport. It's not hooking up. It's not friends with benefits. It's not all those things that MTV has told you it is. And when it becomes a game, and a recreational sport, it will forever lose its ability to mean, I really love you. It will forever lose that ability. It's ridiculous. Sex can mean different things to different people at different times, and that is completely normal and completely okay. It can be different expressions of different things depending on who your partner is or when you're having sex. It's up for you and your partner at any given time to decide what sex means between you at that time. Having sex for one reason at one time with one person doesn't remove your ability to have sex for a different reason at a different time with the same or a different person. To say it does is blatantly false and pure fear-mongering. Um, and then she ends her hour and a bit long talk. This was long, it was draining, I know. Uh, she just ends it by saying, choose abstinence, not death. So that's fun. <laughs> and there we go. That is the end of Pam's first talk. Sex has a price tag. So. Again, some of this wasn't horrible. There were probably about five to seven minutes of quality information in this hour and a bit long talk. Uh, the bit about chlamydia was half decent. The bit about HPV being a virus, that was true. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> no, but she takes these like minor bits of actual real information and then just twists them and pulls them and mashes them back together in order to fit her abstinence only agenda. And the problem is there is so much misinformation in here, there is so much shaming in here, there is so much of her ego in here. It's just not helpful to anyone. And I think showing things like this to teenagers and young people is really, really dangerous. It's not gonna help anyone, it is actively gonna harm people. And that's why I wanna talk about these things on my channel and try and correct the misinformation out there and make sure that anyone who was in school and saw this when they were in school, and I think some people told me that it's still being played in some schools, anyone who sees this today, I want them to know how wrong so much of this is. I don't want them to feel ashamed of the things Pam wants them to feel ashamed of. And I wanna make sure they're provided with the knowledge that they can go out there and make the best possible decisions for themselves and make sure they're keeping themselves safe, make sure they're keeping any partners they have safe, and make sure they're well informed and happy and healthy and 
all that good stuff. But anyway, that's where I'm gonna end this today. Please let me know down in the comments if you have any other suggestions for things you wanna see me cover in videos. If you ever saw Pam Stenzel talk, let me know what happened. If you saw this talk in your school, let me know what it was like. Um, and all the other good stuff. Or if this is the first time you're seeing this and hearing about her like it was me, let me know your thoughts on that too. But for now, uh, yeah, thank you for watching today. I appreciate you a hell of a lot. And I will see you guys again very, very soon.